Farmers Podcast. Five is a mad monolith production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers, sisters, friends, and yes, all of you foes out there as well. And welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Didi Hussein, and my co host, and my blood brother. Aki Hussein, assalamu alaikum, everyone. And today, yes, you guessed it, it's yet another special guest. Maybe I need to find another word to actually describe our guest. Amazing. 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 What? Unique. What? Interesting. What? Fascinating. Okay, fine. Well, how are you just going to buoy me up with my thesaurus? No, no, we can cut this out and then... No, you're not going to cut this out. Why did you have to do that for? We've got another amazing and fantastic guest today and someone who's actually very close to me in the sense of profession and that is journalist and author Hussein Kasvani. Assalamu alaikum Hussein. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited. We're excited Wanted to be here. Yeah. yeah, we're happy to have you. I'm really excited Thank to have you here as well, my brother. How was your journey to Bedford? It was good. You know, I've never been. I've been to Luton before, but I haven't been to Bedford. Um, so it was just really nice, like walking around and being like, oh, I haven't. I don't know whether it's the weather. Like, I have this theory that the weather just makes even like the kind of even the most kind of dry towns look really good. Hundred percent. I don't. Know, I think. I. I don't know. I. 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 I like this place. It's okay. really. Do you find it to be very different in your short walk to Luton? Um. Because this is the, this is the Muslim Asian area. Yeah, but from what I from what I've seen, like this seems like more of a uh, it seems more suburban than Luton. But it is. That's... It is. We need to somehow get to the point where people stop associating Bedford so on. Uh, but Luton has some beautiful suburban areas. Of course, it has like the Luton Downs is is gorgeous. And Luton is kind of regarded as our older A6 brothers as well. Of course. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So have you? How's how's the book sale been going? Uh, it seems to be going well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems to be going well. It was last time I checked, it was still a bestseller on Amazon in Islamic studies. Congratulations. Which is really good. Um, you know, it's been, it's been, uh, the only thing that's kind of overtaken it recently has been like copies of the Holy Quran. Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm taking that as like a, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm taking that as a, uh, as, as a sign that like it's doing all right, but maybe it's also just because my parents keep like ordering copies to give various <laughs> relatives. So maybe, maybe they're like driving all myself. Uh, are you ready to put your feet up and retire? Have you made enough money from it? Um, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we can talk about how much money you make from books okay. um, in some other conversation. <laughs> I'm, this, the spoiler is you don't make much from it. Oh um, dear. Um, I've got to like, go back to my day job after this. Oh so. god. <laughs> and what is the day job? I edit a magazine called Mel. It's a uh, men's interest publication that is based out in LA. Hmm. You know, you know, you know. I'm not going to ask you that kind of quintessential question. Oh, so what inspired you to write the book? Yeah. Right. I'm going to ask you this. Well, we want to know, right? But you, but so what inspired wait. you to write the book? So I know, I you didn't want to. You didn't want to. I want to know the hard thing. You know, you sent me some questions last night, <laughs> yeah. and I was just like, "Oh, this is going to be a this is going to tasty be one, yeah." Yeah. Look, this could end. This could end very bad. No, 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 no. I value, I value our friendship. We are blood brothers for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> look, look, you know, you know, before you put pen to paper with this book, right? Yeah. Uh, follow me, Aki, the online world of British Muslims, right? Or follow me, Aki. No, that's your name. No, 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 but come on. It depends which part of in India you're from. Okay, well, you could be following me, Akhi. You could be following me, Ak. Okay, whatever it is, yeah. right? Follow me, Akhi, the online world of British Muslims. <coughs> Before you put pen to paper with this book, right? Would you say that you had access to the mainstream community? For, and the point I want to make here is it wasn't a case of people that you've met as a result of your line of work, but these were existing relationships you had prior to, let's say, working for BuzzFeed or Vice or sure. so. Um, no, it was interesting because obviously like not just in the sense that this has been the people who have been in this book and the stories that are told are kind of a culmination of like five years worth of really kind of looking into this space. I haven't kind of written about Muslims professionally and before, um, you know, so one of my first jobs was working at the Islam channel. So I met a few characters, including you yeah. back then. I remember like reaching out and being like, hey, I'm a producer on the show and like I might have to like book you at some point. Yeah, so yeah. we should like talk. I that. Um, was he thinner then? Uh, oh, I can't remember. Maybe we were all thinner then. Yeah, we were I was thinner then. Were you? Uh, much thinner then. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but in terms of like growing up, if that's the question, yeah, yeah. no, because I grew up in Dartford and Kent, and that's a very kind of white area. Oh, God. Um, and I also grew up in like a Shia family, so like lots of kind of. So I knew like some of the well-known Shia, um, like the Kodja Shias that were part of my community, and like the big speakers. So, you know, I. I had sort of known kind of guys like Amun Nakshwani from like a young age because I had seen him reciting at the mosque. Yeah, yeah. I had seen, you know, so in the Shia space, I knew and my family knew like a few people. But in terms of 
British mainstream spaces in terms of kind of like the community uh, leaders and the change makers, not really until I started kind of working at the Islam Channel and then later when I started kind of reporting on Muslim communities and culture mm. from around about 2015. You know what I believe, you know what my favorite part of your book was? It was the introduction. Oh, no way. Okay. And, 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 and the tribute that you made to your grandmother. Oh, thank you. May Allah have mercy on her soul. I mean, and, um, and what I found was that you mentioned very briefly that you actually had at some point in your life a crisis in faith. Yeah. Uh, a big one. A massive. I, I feel like I always go through I, in the same way that lots of people go through yeah. crisis of the faith. But that was a big one. Yeah, yeah. and and so 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 ever so brief. I mean, f how did you get from that mm. the, that that crisis point in life yeah. to then kind of you know grounding yourself in the fact that okay, you know what, I am a Muslim. Yeah, this is my background and my tradition, and this may have an influence in the profession that I'm going to go into. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting one because I don't think they were necessarily like all linked, but it was so the the crisis that you were talking about was. Um, this period of time as a teenager when I decided to kind of become an atheist mm. and that was also the time when like you know the God delusion had come out and like the uh, the new atheists had just begun and the new atheists were very different to how they are now so we kind of associate new atheism at the moment with being <clears throat> a lot more hostile to Islam than they are with like other religions Dorcas, yeah. Harris, um, you know even Sam Harris like yeah. in this podcast has kind of said that even though I'm still an atheist like I still see value in like Christian culture that was something that he didn't say at all back in like 2005 six. Yeah. you know the new atheists back then were very much like no all religion is bad mm. um all like any sort of kind of affinity with religion is just like stupid and idiotic mm. and the way that we're going to get to like a better humanist society is through kind of full-scale humanism um, and if that requires like a war and like various wars in the Middle East, then like so be it. <laughs> um, and back then, like, you know, so this was also the time of like peer to peer uh, file sharing. So things like Kazaa and like yeah, Pirate yeah. Bay and all that stuff. Yeah. So I got all my new atheist books from the Pirate Bay yeah, yeah. Um, because my parents wouldn't have bought it up for me. Like, they would have been like, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. You know, my dad was in the mosque and like, you know, the, uh, the speaker would be like, you know, you've got to be very careful about these books, these Richard Dawkins times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like part of it was rebellion because as a teenager, you always go through rebellious phases. And when you're kind of a suburban, when you're, when you live in the suburbs and you're also like quite an obedient kid, you know, my parents ran a corner store and I wasn't really allowed to go out anywhere because we'd have to open the shore, but you know, the shop in the morning. Yeah. So my version of rebellion was to kind of become an atheist in a lot of ways. So I don't think I was really attacked. Some serious that, rebellion. That's a serious rebellion because yeah, you, because you could have like, yeah. because because have <laughs> taken money from the council. Yeah, or like, <laughs> or, or like not opened the shop. I mean, yeah, there were like, you know, there were like relatives of mine who were like, you know, they stayed Muslim, but they were doing drugs and mm -hmm. they were like, you know, stealing money and yeah, like yeah. going out of girls. You know, I was just in my room all day, just like, you know, um, abandoning my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You went um, straight to the top. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, you know, and a part of it was rebellion. Part of it was also just like I had grown up in a kind of culturally religious community, so it was one where culture and religion were kind of meshed together, and it was very difficult to kind of. Which is very common. Yeah, it's very common in the Desi community. In the Desi community, yes, yes, for communities. But I think when you you can get to an age where like you're kind of navigating multiple identities, and you're mm. sort of wondering at that point, well, who am I? Like. Mm what is my relationship with my faith? Like mm. on the one hand, you're navigating this very white space in school mm. where, you know, people routinely mispronounce your name and like all that stuff. And also post 7-7, when they're kind of assuming that you're a particular kind of, of Muslim, then you're at home and you're being told that, you know, you're this type of Muslim. So you can't be friends with other types of Muslims. Mm. Um, and you can't definitely can't be friends with like Hindus or Sikhs or anything. Mm. Um, and then you're also being told by like, people that even believing in religion is really stupid mm. like you know are you kind of mentally deficient by doing so so you're kind of constantly navigating those spaces and it's really difficult it's a really hard thing to do and a really extraordinary thing to do which is but also an experience that so many of us grew up with and I think for me like I was just searching for this identity and for me atheism wasn't about like I reject God for like logical reasons or um, you know, things that I inherently thought out. It was more like, I just want to kind of find a sense of myself and maybe rejecting these things that I've been given with mm -hmm. or, get, or get, you know, been given since birth. Maybe that's the answer to it. Um, and then over time, I sort of realized that like this wasn't, because I never really left this line. Like, I don't think. I think, and part of that is kind of what informs the book, which is, you know, that Muslim identity kind of exists you know, regardless of whether you choose. So there's like, one of my favorite stories in the book is when I went to hang out with an ex-Muslim yes. who, um, the opening the opening scene, I still remember this night, it was such a weird night. 
um, you know, where he's kind of inaugurating leaving Islam by eating like a juicy pork sandwich. And this is the first time he's eaten pork. Now he doesn't have to do this, right? There are lots of ex-Muslims who like don't eat pork and they just say, okay, well, I'm just done with the faith. The entire ex-Muslim movement is still based on the fact that we haven't actually left Muslims, uh, Islam or Muslims. It, sometimes when I see the kind of ex-Muslim movement, that's, that's been, not those who leave Islam yeah. and just crack on with their life. I'm talking about the movement, which yeah. has kind of been weaponized against Islam and Muslims. Yeah. You'll find that it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you can't get over an ex, Kind of not that I've ever had any. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to like. You know, I feel like lots of ex-Muslim stories are different. So yeah. I don't want to like. I, I've, got, I've got no ex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to. Uh, like. Uh, I don't want to say that this is the ex-Muslim. That's fine. Be, be so. Be politically correct. Well, okay, so <laughs> carry on. That's fine. Carry yeah. on. You do that. You, you do, do this. You do that. I you do that. I agree. With, <laughs> yeah. I agree with Billy that from yeah. our experience, especially the ones that are quite popular and right. the ones that you often find being circulated yeah. um, and opinions, or whether it's articles or videos or yeah. whatever it may be, it often seems to be a a drive and this interest to. Is it, continue being involved with Islam, uh, but from the other perspective. So now we're going to be, oh, we're going to oppose. Sure, but I think to a certain extent, this is what I was trying to get to. It was like this guy who I had spoken to. The inauguration, the yeah, he, so inauguration. He, I think he openly acknowledged that like, even if he left his faith in the most visible way possible, um, by doing this kind of thing in front of people, um, he would never really kind of, he would never like leave entirely. And part of that is because, like, you know, just the nature of his name and, like, the way that he's seen by the state, for example. So he's a cultural Muslim. He's, like, a cultural, you know. And that's something that Quillian Foundation these guys use now. So Majid Nawaz now says, I'm a... No, no, that's a new thing now. I'm, I'm not... I'm culturally Muslim. I'm a culturally Muslim, which means yeah. you can't take my name away from me. You can't take my skin colour away from me. Yeah. You can't take certain norms. But, so, I'm not a Muslim, but I'm a cultural Muslim. Have you heard... You, that's, that's, I've, I've, I've heard of it. And again, like, I feel like it's a complicated... Because some people kind of... I, I see where the argument goes. Because, again, this guy, I'm here was like, well, my name is Amir. So like people are always, the first thing that people are going to ask me is like, you know, are you a Muslim? And they're always going to see me through that lens of being a Muslim, unless they spend time with me. And at the same time, he also felt that he had to like really perform in order to kind of leave Islam. So again, like this whole like pork sandwich thing. So did he have this was, pork sarni? He had some of it. He he was sick. You know, I was interviewing him while he was <laughs> right. fucking up behind <laughs> his pub. Oh no way. He's um, again, but one of the strangest He got pork sarni from a pub. Hmm? Pork sarni from a pub as yeah. well. Yeah. Like, so this pub in Holborn, and like I'm interviewing him at the back of his pub while he's like throwing up, and I'm just like, you know, I really don't get paid enough for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it was like a really telling moment because it was sort of like, you know, these parts of identity, these parts of cultural identity, which sometimes you keep for yourself, but sometimes it's sort of just imposed on you, mm. um, and you can't get away from, regardless of like how you want to do it. So. Again, even with him, he has to reconcile with this kind of these remnants of Muslim identity. Um, you know, whether that's theatrical or whether that is something that he inherently, you know, believes in or says that he has. And there are like variations of that. So again, with like the Majid Nawaz thing and the whole idea of like cultural Muslim, there are lots of people who I interviewed who didn't make it in the book who identified in those terms. They said, well, I am a Muslim in the sense that like I identify as one and I, I believe in Allah, but like I don't pray and I don't, you know, fast. And hmm. sometimes like I drink alcohol. So I'm a sinful Muslim. You know, so yeah, but like, you know, and then, yeah. and so then there are like questions, or I, I'm Muslim who sins, but like, I still like believe in God, I still like pay for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so there are like variations, and there are kind of different ways in which people reconcile parts of themselves with their faith. And sometimes that's like a complete rejection of what their family believe in. Sometimes that is kind of the opposite direction, where they're like, well, I grew up in a secular Muslim family, and but I feel that like I need to be more authentic to the faith, so I'm going to kind of practice in a way that's very different. There are mm. like, Muslims who came from one sect and practice in another because they believe that it's more authentic. Mm. So yeah. you know there are variations, but within those within those threads within those threads, um, you know the, the same type of story is happening, which is like how do how do Muslims living in Britain kind of reconcile aspects of their individual identity with what they owe their communities and what they feel they owe their religion? Mm. You know, um, obviously the entire book has some very, very interesting individuals that, that you've met, you've interviewed yeah. uh, throughout the years. And it goes without say, it'd actually be an injustice if we didn't mention, mention Abu Antar, right? Okay. My, yeah, my boy Abu Antar. My, your yeah. boy Abu Antar. Now, <laughs> who, who I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the, when he said to you, follow me, Akhi, that mm. the, the entire book was entitled after yes. that, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Now, tell me, now besides Abu Antar, right, the ISIS supporting Abu Antar, and hopefully myself as well. 
Yeah. Is there anyone else that really stood out? <laughs> you were the most interesting no, person. Right. No, you're wrong. Um, no. Is, there yeah. anyone, is there anyone else that really actually stood out? Because you can't just be like, every single person was so interesting. There must have been a few people that it's just true, stood out. It's true though. They were, like, they were all interesting. Okay, so... So I think like the story, the Amir's story was like the most, like of all of the most, most interesting to me because I came in sort of like not really understanding. I came, I came out rather like understanding more about the nuances of like the ex-Muslim experience than I did going in. So as a journalist, that was like a really useful thing for me. Like when you kind of, when, when you enhance your knowledge, like it's a really useful thing for like mm. a reporter, as you know. Mm. Um, you know, there were the first story in the book, which was about these two men who kind of do Jumma prayers yes. in their flat, like yep. a really simple story. Yep. Um, because they felt that like their masjid wasn't kind of adequate because it wasn't giving them the kind of like, um, the the, 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 that they, yeah, the, they shot, yeah. The, the enrichment that they were seeking from a hookah, they yeah. weren't getting it. Yeah, took things on, on, on hand, yeah. And that was like one of the last stories that I was reporting on, but it was the first story that I put in the book because I felt that it really set the tone for what was happening, which was like, these are Muslims who are making very simple changes. They are using kind of the internet to enhance aspects of their religion. They're not kind of directly challenging it. They're not kind of questioning the positions of authority or anything. They are just doing something very, very simple because they feel that like their lived material experience when they're practicing faith is not kind of meeting the mark that they expect. And it also shows that like how they view faith is very different. So, you know, they say that, you know, our families, they go to the local masjid and mm -hmm. like, you know, you see people who are just like on their phones or like not really paying attention and they're going just for kind of the sake of going yeah, um, because they're expected to go. But we as Muslims, we kind of have a relationship with our religion where we believe that like our religion is um, an impetus for like, it calls for social change. And if our masjid isn't giving that to us, if it's not kind of allowing us to kind of think about our faith in relation to social change and political change, then we have to make that change for us to be sure. true to our faith. So that was like a really interesting story to me because of just how simple it was. Um, you know, the stories about like halal dating and everything were really interesting. Um, you know, just just because that was just like a bizarre experience. Like yeah. the amount of like creams that yeah. I like I spent time in was just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so many creams. <laughs> Unbelievable amount. Um, and also just like third wheeling yeah. all of these like yeah. dates. Um <laughs> just like yeah, it was I, I don't I don't even know how to like how I was even able to do half that stuff. But you know, I'll I'll tell you this, like the the opening <laughs> story, we were in this like Afghan restaurant and I'm like eating like pilau on my own. Mm on a table, like trying to kind of covertly listen to this conversation um, of this like horrible day that's going on. And I'll tell you like, that's one of the most depressing things you can do. Oh my God. Um, and it, I mean, it was, it's pretty good. I can't remember what the restaurant name was, but it it's must somewhere. must be really funny as well. Yeah, there were times when it's like, this is, this is hilarious. <laughs> um, in terms of like interesting, interesting, like really, cause like, I, I don't want to be cliche because everyone who I interviewed had like an interesting story to tell. Um, I guess like the last, the, the last interesting one. How was... interesting was my story from a scale to one to ten, saying? Oh, it was a good like eight. That's a good eight. Yeah, what did you want? Ten. I think, I think the saying has been nice. No, no, it was a good. It was a good eight. That's like, like a strong. First. I read my couple of pages and I was like, <laughs> wow, I, my stuff is so boring compared to everyone else. I, I, but anyway, that's fine. Eight. Um, I live with an eight. The media, the media stuff was really interesting mm. because also you know as as a journalist like. You know, um, I've worked in kind of secular outlets pretty much my entire life. Um, and I've worked for kind of non-religious organizations, mm. like non-overtly religious organizations my whole life. And there's always been this question of like, if you're a Muslim reporter in like a very white newsroom, like what are the kind of microaggressions that you face? What are the kind of challenges that you face? Mm. Um, and the purpose of the section that you're in is to talk about, well, how do Muslims kind of reclaim narratives? Mm. If we're talking about how like narratives get twisted and how they get manipulated by bad faith actors and bad faith like reporter, mm. reporters and columnists in the press, you know, you have this movement of Muslims who are like, well, if we can't change it from within, we, we have to like change it externally. And, and like, that's it. And, and that's yeah. it. And, that, and that's exactly what my thinking was. right? Mm. Um, and, and in the book, you've actually mentioned, and even in some conversation, you've mentioned to me that the idea a while ago was that you've smashed it once you've got your news desk in Whitehall. Right. Yeah. Is that still? Is that still a thing? No, no. Like it was for a long time because my, my story into journalism was my story about convincing my dad that I should 
I should try this, was, again, we were at the shop and they were very angry because at the time, my parents were very angry because at the time, um, they wanted me to become a solicitor, like my cousins. <laughs> All my cousins are like doctors and lawyers, yeah, yeah. like just a cliche. So, um, <laughs> so they let me do a history degree, but they were like, okay, we'll let you do a history degree on the promise that you go do law school afterwards. So I was like, okay, fine. Um, and to afford to go to law school, I would have had to get a training contract. Yeah. I couldn't afford to do it myself. Cool. So I applied to like 15 firms and I got rejected by every single one of them. It's like my last month of uni and I'm like, I have literally no idea what I'm going to do. Um, you know, my dad's just like, oh, maybe I should take out a loan to like pay for law school. I was like, no, you can't do that. Like I would just, you know, that was like a nightmare situation. Um, and at the time I was like, well, okay we were having this argument and I remember like we were watching Channel 4 News and at the time uh, Faisal Islam was the economics editor yep, yeah. and he showed up on TV and I was like that's who I'm going to be I'm going to be Faisal Islam mm -hmm. and me and you were talking about this before which was like well you know when you see a, when you see a brown person with the name Islam on TV I'm loving it my dad's like oh actually maybe maybe you could do this before it was just like you know oh what so you're just going to like blog online or you know I used to like <laughs> I used to have a blog I used to write for the student newspaper from time mm -hmm. to time um, and like that didn't really mean anything. It was like, oh, it's like a you know very nice hobby that you have, but like yeah. one day you've got to grow up. But when my dad saw Fight of the Sun on TV, like that's when things changed. So yeah, the, the, met um, the metrics for success when it comes to journalism, especially with the first generation, like like yeah, I remember when, when I told my dad, even though dad didn't have a, an expectation of me to um, you know become a lawyer or a doctor, I know he would have loved it. Mm. My my thinking at, when I was I wanted to get into the civil service. Yeah, I wanted to work for the Home Office in, in immigration, like my sister did. But with yeah. in light of the, the prevent strategy and everything <coughs> that was happening back in two thousand and eight nine, yeah, sure. I just couldn't reconcile the fact that I'd be working for the Home Office as a civil servant right. whilst all this was happening. So I looked into journalism. Yeah, and I remember my dad's face when my first article came out in the British on Sunday with the with my byline. Yeah. It meant everything to him. Right. Yeah. My yeah. son's name, Diddy Hussein, even though he didn't even like the fact that my name was Diddy, right? <laughs> he believed that for the newspapers, my name should be Muhammad Dilwar Hussein. Yeah. Nevertheless, the byline meant everything to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember the first time I appeared on TV, mm -hmm. it was like, smashed it. So the metrics for our parents' generation when yeah. it comes to journalism is yeah. TV. Well, for mine, it's very much like Mehdi Hassan, mm. right? So, like, whenever people kind of think about Muslim journalism in the UK, they always think of Mehdi Hassan. Mehdi Hassan, yeah. Um, like, you know, Mehdi Hassan, he's so good, isn't he? Like, mm. that's what people say, like, you know, mm. um, do you know Mehdi Hassan? And now it's kind of like, yeah, I do I do know him. Mm. Um, and I do know that he's on TV a lot. Mm. And I don't want to be on TV because um, I'm not as, like, charismatic as he is. Uh, but they're still like, no, you should go on TV. You should go. So I still feel the metric is still very much, like, you know, I could publish a book and it could be like a bestseller for months, but it's still like not TV. Yeah, okay. But anyway, that's how I convinced him to let me do it. And at the time, at, at the time also, like the only kind of really notable brown journalists were Faisal Islam and Aditya Chakravorty, who was economics leader writer at The Guardian. Rage Omar? Hmm? Rage Omar? Uh, kind of. I think like he was, he, he wasn't around much. So, um, what period are we talking? This is like maybe 2010. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or 2013. Okay. Numbers. So, like, Ruggie Omar's kind of, you know, there are like other, like, you know, there's like uh, Krishna Guru Murphy and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But, like, the people that I was, that were really kind of standing out to me were Aditya Chakraborty and Faisal Islam. Mm. Um, both who were started doing economics and politics. So, I was like, okay, well, it makes sense that I should just do economics and politics, do that kind of reporting. So, my aim was like, okay. I'm going to like do an NCTJ with the money that I have left from my student loan. And I did it at Lambeth College, uh, which was uh, this kind of I know. further education college yeah, yeah. in South London. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was kind of like freelancing and doing some tutoring like at the same time to kind of just like pay my way and everything. Can I just ask what year that was? That was in 2013, 14. So it was like a four month course. So how old are you? So I am 27. It's yeah, 27, years. Okay. I considered Lambeth, that's why. Okay, I did my NCG in a place called No Sweat. Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they were like the two, if you couldn't afford to go to Sissy, which yeah. was my situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. those were the two you went to. And Lambeth was just like the cheapest. Yeah. And it was also the, the closest to... £900, I believe it was. Somewhere around that. Well, it was in 2010. Yeah, I can't remember how much it was, but I just about, I was just about able to use the last of my student loans mm. to pay for it. And it was enough. It wasn't too far away from like my parents' store or anything. Mm. So I could still kind of work in the mornings and then go into college after that. So, so Lambeth College... Lambeth College, uh, Economics and Politics Reporting. Yeah, um, so after I finished Lambeth College, I didn't actually start out as a reporter. I started out at a tech company um, who were trying to produce 
this was back in 2014, um, they were trying to kind of do audio news before people will listen to podcasts. Mm. I think they were like slightly ahead of their time, but also very badly run. Yeah. Um, so I was working as a front end developer, kind of taught myself coding via YouTube. Um, um, because like that was the only job that I could get, right? Yeah. They were like, you know, I was, I was doing a training, I was doing my training during my NCTJ at a small kind of retail newspaper. Um, again, it was like really, um, I did like a lot of unpaid internships at the Observer which really sucked um you know and then at the end of like my month unpaid internship at the years of ever, we were like well we're not going to keep you on um not because we don't like the work that you're doing but just because like we don't really want to like you know we'd rather you be here five days a week unpaid rather than one day a week unpaid. Yeah, yeah. um so, so i ended up like i ended up getting a job at this retail newspaper called the retail gazette which kind of reported on news agents, which is the thing that I kind of had a lot of access to. Yeah. That was the way I got in. Um, so after that, I started working at the tech company doing front end developer. And then after a couple of months there, I was lucky to kind of get reference to the Islam channel um, by a friend of mine who was a producer on the news thing. And they were like, well, one of our producers have left. So do you want to come and like, you know, it's a good way of like getting started and everything. Um, so I kind of marked that as like the beginning of how I got started in this industry and also how I got started really thinking about the Muslim space and like what that means in a news context rather mm. than just kind of a culturally lived context. But, but, but even in that, so even with your stint at Islam Channel, yeah. you still kind of made a conscientious decision to not remain in the Muslim space because, mm. because Vice News, BuzzFeed, it was BuzzFeed first, wasn't it? Oh, so Vice was only freelancing. Huh? Okay, but Buzzfeed? Uh, so Buzzfeed was after Islam Channel. Okay, but it was it was Buzzfeed, which is still kind of a non-Muslim secular yeah. alternative media. Yeah, album, yeah, right. Yeah, but you kind of you you made a decision to kind of maybe I've misinterpreted. Forgive me, but was yeah. it, was it a case of still wanting to stay within the mainstream, but represent the Muslim voice within the mainstream? I don't think it was about representation. I think with the Islam channel, it was very much like, it was, part of it was career driven in the sense that like, I know I didn't want to be a front end tech developer. I didn't want to work in tech. I trained to be a journalist and I wanted to be a journalist. And with the Islam channel, like I wasn't working on like the religion, you know, the way that it was split and it was physically split. Religious, you finished the office. Yeah, yeah you have religious, religious TV yeah, yeah, and you have current affairs. Yeah, current affairs yeah. So I was working in current affairs. So in many ways, I was just working for like a local TV station, yeah. but I used to like pray in the afternoons mm. and, you know, I used to like say Islamicum to like the bosses and everything, right? Mm. Um, so it didn't really feel like I was working at like an Islamic TV station. And it also didn't feel like I was representing anyone. Like I was a producer and my job was just to book guests. After and, like, Islam channel though. I'm talking uh, about after Islam channel. Yeah. Um, I don't think it was, so when Buzzfeed hired me, they were like, we want you to write about religion, but we want you to write about like Muslim affairs in particular, because, but the editor in chief at the time was like, we feel that the way Muslims are represented in mainstream media isn't adequate. Mm. And we want someone who's like young and can kind of like speak about like, you know, youth experiences and stuff like that. I don't necessarily, you know, on hindsight, maybe I wasn't the right person because again, like I feel like someone who had better access from the, from the get go would have might, might have been able to navigate that space a bit easier. Yeah. But for me, it was partly, well, Islam channel wasn't really paying me until like the last two months right um so i was like i was still like tutoring in the evenings like not sleeping and stuff um and like asking my dad for money to like pay for bus tickets and everything um which like at the age of 23 is not, not yeah, something it's not, it's not i did not expect that you know when you see your friends who are like corporate lawyers or just starting the corporate lawyers and like with their like 30k starting salaries you're like yeah okay um i, I don't know if i messed up here or what um, so both people were paying me. That's, mm. that's, that's, a, that's a starting point. Yeah. Also, I felt that they were giving me like a freedom to actually be a reporter. So, so, so you didn't feel restricted then? I didn't really feel that. So I didn't feel restricted in terms of... How many of your pitches got declined? Okay, so that's a different question. Because I don't think I was restricted in a very active sense. In any newsroom, you get restricted in terms of what you can do. Because sometimes you can be like overly ambitious, yeah. for example. And they'll be like, no, you need to like, you know, you're just a junior producer, stay in your lane. Calm down, take it um, easy. They would always let me pitch stuff. But- Because I'm, I'm interested to know how yeah. ideas were influenced and how things were presented to you from BuzzFeed with regards to a certain subjects. There was never like an overt, like, this is how we want you to portray things. Or like, yeah. this is how we think certain people are. Sure. Um, partly that was because the people I was working with at BuzzFeed were mostly like political and social courses. So for them, like religion was a really kind of like, Oh, we don't know much about that, but we'll trust that you know. 
how that works. Okay. So on the one hand, especially like at the beginning, it was like this really free and interesting place where I could kind of experiment with some ideas and really think about like what stuff I wanted to write about that wasn't on, that I couldn't kind of produce on television. Yeah. So one of the stories that I was really proud of doing was a story about three gay Muslim men who were like, they used to kind of form this support group, which were like, okay, we have these kind of, you know, inclinations and these feelings, but we also want to kind of stay true to our faith in the way that we interpret it. So we are going to kind of remain abstinent, or in some cases we're going to like marry women, but have kind of these, you know, to them like somewhat like unconventional marriages. These sham marriages. No, I, sham isn't, because I don't want to like, I don't want to say that the marriages aren't legitimate or anything. Um, but, but marriage in the purpose that's of... That's a bit harsh. I, I, yeah. Sorry, so sham... Well, that's a bit harsh. Okay, marriages to maybe as a compromise for family? In some cases, or like to just be like, well, I feel like marriage is much more about just like physical intimacy. Okay. It's also about like religious... Um, but they weren't, religious bi- they weren't bisexual. No, not as far as I know. Um, but that was a story about like, that was a story that I know that Islam Channel would have been very, it would have been very, no, they're not they, they would have been very That's too much. No, no, no. I don't know too much, but it would also be like, I don't know how we approach the subject. So BuzzFeed gave me a lot of freedom to do that. But I think at the same time, the thing that I found frustrating about just that beat in general, and it isn't like BuzzFeed, this is like the beat in general, which is that you're also very conscious about the audience that you're writing for. And you're tending to write for like a young, largely white, largely secular, non-religious, fairly liberal audience. Mm. Um, so as a result, like certain stories that are in the book. So for example, the opening story that I was talking to you about, about yeah. these young men who yeah. are forming their own prayer spaces in their flat. For us, it's really interesting because it's like we live in this kind yeah. of community where you understand what that type of intentionality means. Mm. But when you're writing for that audience, like they don't get it. Like if I pitch that story, they'll be like, okay, so what? Okay, people pray at home. Okay, yeah, like you know. it's, it's, it's more kind of a, a micro reality which we we, we, we can empathize on. We can yeah. understand that, but in the way of the appetite necessarily. But yeah, but like it's such an important thing when we're talking about like how Muslim experiences in Britain. Of course, no, yeah, we understand the significance of that. Yeah. So, did you have a sense? Did you have a sense then, at least at Buzzfeed, right? Uh, because whilst generally speaking, that the atmosphere and the environment in most newsrooms are generally the same, but with regards to specific topics, right? Depending on where. A particular outlet fall within the spectrum. Did you still feel that at Basri there was a kind of expectation with regards to juicy Muslim terror related stories? Towards the end, kind of. Well, that was controversially, more, like but, liberally controversial. But this was more like to do with like a very ambitious small news desk that was trying to like get as many scoops as possible. So that pressure was put on all of us, right? So like if you were the LGBT reporter, then you were like, you had to go get like, you know, LGBT scoops. Or if you were a political reporter, you had to go get your political scoops by any means necessary. How you apply like scoop getting culture to religion reporting mm. is a different question. Cause like number one, the religion beat isn't really that well established in the UK and has declined a lot. Like I feel there's maybe one or two religion reporters, dedicated religion reporters left working. One of them works at the Telegraph and just really covers Church of England press releases. The other one is Harriet Sherwood. Yeah, Guardian, Guardian, right. Guardian, yeah. um, so, this is not an established beat in the same way that in the US it is. And what I found was also with religion, like you really have to take your time with things. You really have to like, you know, actually no, I was wrong. So there's a really smart journalist called Sophia Gaylor who works at the BBC, who is doing some really interesting work um, covering like religion in a way that's actually quite meaningful and quite um, like really, really refreshing. But to kind of get that opportunity to do that is so rare because number one, you have to be at an organization that appreciates the time that it takes to do religion reporting, the time it takes to kind of really build rapport with religious communities who, especially those who are kind of very, or are kind of not necessarily hostile, but suspicious of media or don't feel that the media like best represents them and their beliefs in like a holistic way. Besides Muslims, who felt that? I mean, Christians feel it. Um, mm. Yeah, there's a lot of Christians who feel that. Um, How often did you cover non-Islam Muslim related stories? Uh, very rarely. Very rarely. So there was, was, yeah, there was also that pressure of being like... Oh, so, so even as a kind of religion correspondent, it was still predominantly Islam and Muslims you're covering? For the most part, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, because that was the stuff that they were interested in. Then towards the end of my time there, it became, especially as like the ISIS stuff kind of really... Yeah, that, up. that dominated news from yeah. 2015 onwards. Religion, re- religion news ended up becoming intertwined to like counter-extremism. Yeah. It tended to, be, tended to either be categorized into these stories of, look at these inspirational Muslims doing things that are countering like extremists, mm. 
or look at these people who are Perpetual. doing something in relation to like so everything was kind of around the periphery of extremism and ISIS in Syria mm -hmm. and I felt towards the end of my time that like I wouldn't like if I stayed in this direction mm. if I stayed in the scoop getting direction which was really just like trying to find who was the next young person who went over to Syria or who's the, who are the people who are trying to get back or like who is this kind of notorious ISIS person mm. um not only would that have kind of been a very fruitless exercise in terms of what I was hired to do, but at the same time, it also would have really kind of undermined my reporting because so much of like this is access based. Mm. So to kind of get that material, to kind of get that, um, to get those kind of insights and those scoops, you really need to kind of make friends with like people in who work in CV at the home office or to work with like particular intelligence agencies and stuff like that. Um, something that I was not only not in the position to do because of my lack of access, but something that I felt might kind of morally compromise mm. like a lot of the work that I had done and that I was proud did of. You, did, you, did, you ever, did you ever get a Muslim scoop, yeah, or a Muslim related story, uh, but you felt bad about how you, how you attained that story? Have you ever felt that? No, not in terms of how I attained it, but I did feel that like there were some cases where I kind of the, the demands of like a high paced newsroom meant that I wasn't able to really really think things through in terms of how they were coming out. So even with like that, the gay Muslim story, for mm. example, like I felt really bad that I portrayed it in a way where on the one hand, like people who said that they were gay and Muslim felt they, they were disenfranchised because their experience was sort of, they felt their experience was like kind of undermined in the course of that reporting. And also for the men who were involved, because I think they read some of them read the piece and they were like oh i sound really kind of you know neglectful here this wasn't didn't really capture the you know holis mm. the holistic nature of my experience mm. and part of that was because i wrote i researched and wrote that thing in a week that was That's my good. deadline right yeah, yeah um you know so in some ways like online journalism lends itself to the idea that you have to do things very fast you're being edited by people who don't necessarily understand the nuances definitely when you're not being edited by a religion editor yeah um you end up making those mistakes of course. a lot of the time and, and not all of it's entirely in your sphere of control yeah in fact a lot of the times it won't be right yeah or like in other cases when you know even small things like when you end up having to quote the henry jackson society because oh, you're on a deadline and they've sent you a press release faster than anyone else mm -hmm. um and then you end up getting like dms from people being like why did you like you know you've done this really nice so i did like an obituary of a young man who had died who had um I think I think it was an obituary. I'm not sure, but I did this story, which was just supposed to be this straight down the line story about the NUS, and I ended up like putting a quote in by the Henry Jackson Society because my editor was like, "No, you need kind of like a response comment. You need a balanced comment, right? For balance." And then you end up idea. putting out this story, and it's kind of like, I don't. Number one, I don't really know what that added to anything, but mm. also like I've just annoyed a lot of people, mm. and a lot of people who like would have read this piece and gotten some value from it now see it as like you know you've kind of given credence to this organization who... look bro like, look I, I just, just for our, our viewers and our listeners right you know for those of you and, and, I, and i say this humbly with utmost respect you know sometimes the challenges of a journalist or journalism sometimes people don't understand especially especially working in a secular non-muslim space where there are certain principles that you have to abide by the impartiality um, fair comment the fact that you can write a colorful piece about your community or anyone for that matter but yeah. it still requires a balanced comment from someone yeah right and sometimes it's out of your control with regards to who's actually there to, yeah. to include in that so i would even say that even when you did include the henry jackson society yeah. that wasn't something that you intentionally did. it was just well it was more to do with the fact that they were the only guys there to to, well, they, to they, i mean they came back the fastest but i think the second thing is that because with things like if you're reporting on Muslims, as you know, like mm -hmm. so much of it is about building trust over time. Oh, it and it's about building rapport over time. And things like that can really undermine yeah. that. So in some ways, like whenever you'd have a comment from someone which was like, well, why have you quoted this mm -hmm. person? Mm -hmm. um, and this happens on both sides of, you know, one of the challenges of being a Muslim journalist working in a secular space is that you've kind of got to make everyone happy, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to kind of make one side who might kind of be more sympathetic to like aspects of CBE or aspects of, you know, um, a radicalization problem, yeah, yeah, lack like, of integration. Da, da, da. And then you're trying to make other people who are on the other extreme. The Muslimics. Um, I don't want to give names to anyone. So, um, <laughs> um, you know, that was bare PC, you know, 
<laughs> but I like it. It's nice about you. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Yeah, I'm letting you like say stuff. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, my law- my lawyer has been very good. I'm just messing. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, but you're trying to kind of like balance these both sides. You know, kind of say as a journalist, like yeah. I don't want to impose any of like my, my opinions or my kind of half baked thoughts into this. What I'm really interested in is kind of your experiences and your stories. But who's saying as a journalist? Come on, bro. I mean, as as, as a journalist who's writing a, a copy, right? Right. And you're writing a report. There is some level of control that you can have in terms of swaying how. A story goes. For example, yeah. uh, you know, the, the certain language that you use in terms of who you decide to quote and include for the story, how much of this, the comments you choose. Now, yeah. For example, when, when I was in my NCTJ, we had a, a news writing teacher called Drew Kelly. Yeah. And Drew Kelly said to me that impartiality is such a subjective thing. Right. 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 Like you can meet two people may not the same. Yeah. One sings his praise, one literally slates you to the high heavens, right? Yeah. But when you write a report about Hussein, yeah. ultimately as a reporter, you can choose how much of the good stuff and how much of the bad stuff you decide to include. Yeah. So even when you say you don't want to impose your beliefs and your biases, it happens all the time, bro. It does. I think it happens you know, all literally yeah. all the time from all the newspapers that exist. Every report, which is, whether it be the Telegraph or the Guardian mm-hmm. or the Independent, you'll find that people. They, they, I mean, you have decisions over like who you give platforms to. Yes. You, how much of a platform you give them. Yes. To you. Um, when people talk about impartiality, they talk about it often like in a legal sense, yes. i.e. we need to add some, something to otherwise make sure. yes, we're going to like get, especially if you work in the newspaper yeah. business, where none of us really have a lot of money. But it is um, subjective. I mean, you can, there's, there's only, there's so much, like you can, yeah. you can try literally do it 50-50. Yeah. Or you can just be like, right, I've done a great story about Muslims yeah. or, 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 or Quilliam, 80%, I'll see include satin. But that. there's also like an approach you can take. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes it can work where, okay, you'll give someone who you may personally disagree with, like room to talk, but you're also not, you know, you're also going to give them the room to kind of say their piece in whatever way that they want. Mm. So you do like very little editing in terms of the, the quotations yeah. or, you know, you kind of just use like certain qualifiers to make a sentence kind of functionally work, but you're not kind of adding any, like, um, you're not necessarily adding context for them. Right. So like even, you know, so it's not just a matter of like how much space certain sources being given but it's also like what kind of position are they on a page what um you know how much kind of how how much in terms of like speech are they being given there are people who um you know have complained like to reporters that i know who were like well you interviewed me for an hour and you only added like, you two, two lines sentences. You get the, you get the, this is like a long read of like yeah. eight to ten thousand words yeah, yeah. right um with the story that kind of came in my book about uh the troll the yeah. anti-muslim troll like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. i gave him a lot of time to speak yeah. and in the copy mm. much, you know, a lot some of which like the guardian cut down in like the the printed version yeah, yeah. um i gave him a lot of time to speak because for me it was very much okay we are going to fundamentally disagree on like so much stuff even in terms of like even what you're doing mm. as a troll right and what how useful you think you are but i'm not here to kind of judge your actions i'm here to kind of understand what you think like what you think your place is in the world or in this particular environment and people can take what they want from that right um so that's how i've always kind of seen or that's how i've kind of grown to see my work Mm. over time um you know so you are right but i think it's also the impartiality conversation is a lot more complicated than Mm. just like who you choose to Mm. give a platform to you know just quickly bro sat here as someone who's not a journalist not a muslim journalist you feel a bit left out no 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 no, i'm I'm really interested because i've got a question to ask that probably are a given for people who would be of a similar profession uh, or exposed to a similar line of work what would you say then Mm. in, in addition to what's been discussed in the past five or ten minutes what would you say are the main editorial constraints or restrictions facing a Muslim journalist? Yeah. Whether you are in the mainstream media or whether you are five pillars or whatever it may be yeah. that are difficult to navigate around. He's talking about the things that you have somewhat you have control over yeah. and things that you can influence yourself, choose yeah. to include, choose to exclude. Um, you're giving a fatwa. Are you giving a khutwa? You know, you, I, I, I want to know. Like, yeah. what would you say are the things that you can't navigate around? Bro, because you, because yeah. you, you said that. Well, there's a lot of things in your control. <laughs> I, well, I think that I'm sure. That, I'm sure there'll be many journalists that will say, well, well so that's true. unless you want to get blasted. No, there isn't a no, lot. So, of so, so that's actually two questions. One, I'll let Hussein answer because he has far more experience working in the non-Muslim secular space. 
Whereas my stint was specifically to do with Bedfordshire on Sunday, which was yeah. Bedford's local newspaper, which I worked for for two years. That was my biggest exposure in the normal space, was he said more. And, and so you hated so, it? Hey, 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 I didn't hate and it. And then he was like, no, 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 no. He was like, do you know what? Five pillars of Islam. No, 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 no. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. I just got somewhat tired of covering council tax and council meetings and potholes and and, yeah. and I, I kind of really you got like tired of like the local the local, yeah, yeah, the local stories. Right? But I loved it. I learned all my I learned all my industry disciplines from there. I, you know, I actualized a lot of the things that I learned in my NCTJ. Big up to Chris Gill. Big up to Steve Lau. My two editors that had bare love and respect for me, right? But yeah, I got bored of it eventually. Mm. I didn't. I didn't hate it though. Then hey, that's not nice. And you, you you don't remember. <laughs> so, I, saying, I remember. so I'm saying, what are the constraints? You can say things in retrospect. Yeah. You know, you know yeah. what really yeah. happened. Yeah, exactly. What um, are the what are the constraints of working as a Muslim journalist in the non-Muslim sector? So space? culturally, there are certain kind of restraints which are more about like career access. So for example, there are Muslims who, you know, journalism is still like a very kind of drinking, like socialising, drinking intensive um, industry. Like to kind of yeah. you know, it's a it's a communications game. So initially I found that really difficult to navigate because I still find it very uncomfortable to like be in kind of pubs or like settings with alcohol. Um, and I've sometimes had to do it, right? Like for stories sometimes, or um, when I first started and your boss is like, oh, I'm going to go down to the pub and you're like, okay, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm uncomfortable doing this, but also like I, I have a year to prove to my dad that I can be a journalist. So maybe this is something that I have to do. So a pint of water will have so to do. So like a pint of water will have to do and like, you know, just really kind of praying very hard when I get home for like forgiveness for being in that space. Do you use like, a straw? Hmm? Do you use a straw? Yeah, of course. Okay. Do you, you think I'm that. an animal? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so sometimes like the socializing element was that, uh, and I know for like other Muslims who are, you know, much less compromising, that's kind of almost something that turns you know I, I i was mentoring a young muslim journalist last year who was saying this like i really love my job but i hate the fact that like the way that the, the, the people on the scheme that i'm on are getting ahead because like they're going you know my editor knows them more and they you know my editor will kind of say that to my colleague you know, to to one of my young colleagues um oh you told me on friday night that you were really interested in covering this story so here you go i've been thinking about it and there you go, there's a story for you. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm kind of still on the copy desk writing like scripts and everything. Yeah. How do I communicate? You know, I had to work my way around that. So sometimes it's kind of been like, you know, just inviting lots of people for coffee or being like, oh, I can't make it because like I've got a family thing, but here is something that I wanted to do. And I'll just like email, email it to them. So mm. over time, especially like as your kind of profile gets bigger, you can compromise like a lot less because people will take you more seriously. Sure, but sure, yeah. From your starting point, like, yeah. You really have to, you know, it's really difficult um, for people who don't, can't necessarily adapt to that kind of lifestyle. And so, did you ever adapt. do interviews in shisha cuffs? Uh, not for this one. Okay. It was mostly just creams. Okay. It was creams. mostly creams. Lots of creams, yeah? Um, yeah. We've got one local. Um, <laughs> I have one like right, the one in Whitechapel, you know, the one in Whitechapel, yeah, like, yeah. our office is like right opposite. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like, I just don't, cause it's like, it's still like, yeah. not it's following me. Not necessarily traumatic, but it's like, I just need to have some space from there. Yeah. Um, then in like newsroom, sometimes you can have really patronizing people, right? So that can range from people who, um, you know, there was this, there was this Muslim woman journalist who I was speaking to, who was like in, during Ramzan. And they were trying to can tell their colleague that like Ramzan wasn't like a, wasn't like a diet that they were doing, right? Oh, but God. they weren't like you know starving themselves mm -hmm. as like some sort of like intermittent fasting. Like this was like a holy worship. act of worship, right? Act of worship, yeah. And the colleague just wouldn't get it. So like those small things where it's like you kind of feel otherized, or mm -hmm. when you want to like pray in the newsroom, for example. Like the Islam Channel was a really great place because mm -hmm. well, you could just pray in the middle of the newsroom and it was just a normal thing. Mm -hmm. But I well, remember it is, like, it's a Islam channel. Right. But I remember like at BuzzFeed, for example, like there was nowhere really to pray. Like when I did it during Ramzan, mm. um, I used to pray in like a conference room and there would be people outside who would just be watching me. Because like the, all the glasses were seated. Like it's, it's mad, it's mad. Right. It's mad, yeah. it's mad. And you're kind of like, okay, it's fine. Like it's not a big deal. But when you're kind of feeling watched, it can make you feel somewhat otherized. Have you ever had a non-Muslim um, walk into your feet in the sink? No. I had no. a castle with we, we have, that's no, the you best. Know, you know what the trick is? The trick is to go to the disabled toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right? Fine. That's a trick. Not only do you get more space, yeah. but like, obviously you just don't have any of those problems. Yeah, yeah. Having it. Well, oh. well, 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 or, or, or if you follow the opinion of wiping socks, you make people do in the morning, put your socks on, you wipe your socks. <laughs> I, 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 I but it, 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 but it, there comes a point where 
um, you become really like confident and comfortable in uh, practicing aspects of Islam publicly when you need yeah. to, like work, workspaces uh, where it becomes really, really funny. I had a colleague, uh, I had a colleague called, <laughs> I've had mad encounters. I had a colleague called Keely Knowles in Bedford on Sunday once I was praying and she's walked into where I'm praying and she's just having a conversation with yeah. me while I'm praying. Yeah, yeah, I've had that as well. Uh, and, and she's like, <laughs> why is this guy blanking me? And I'm just praying, she's just yapping away. I've had a colleague walk past me and go, sorry buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just and look at me. I mean, it's a side button. Just need to grab something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So nothing like that has happened to me, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, you do have those moments, and sometimes they can. You know, so I've heard like stories of people who um, have had it a lot worse. So people yeah. who have been kind of told by their editors, like, "Oh, why can't you get ISIS stories for us? Like, don't you know anyone who's oh, got God. right?" Um, or yeah, like my cousin and my next door neighbor. I'll just find one. For yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, things that editors just like will just say, like thinking that it's really normal, and they don't actually realize like how uncomfortable this is making people. Feel. And that's what turns a lot of Muslims off being in like doing mainstream stuff. Like, you understandably, have have, you have to have a thick skin, but also you, um, you know, it's just like. You know, the question is really like, am I going to compromise my individuality? But you have to have a certain level of, of a certain level of vigor and drive. Otherwise, why are you going to put yourself through that? I'm glad the podcast has kind of navigated towards this space because because what I was going to ask you next was and and, 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 and kind of linked to what you asked as well. Look, in in a Muslim media space, there is much more freedom with regards to what you report, how you report. Uh, there's not this kind of overarching feeling of pressure. But it must come with its yeah. own intra-Muslim. Yes. What what the challenge challenges? Yeah. yeah. What the challenge with covering Muslim news is then dealing with the kind of divisions and beef that exists within the Muslim right. community, yeah. Yeah. within the different sects, within the different groups, within the different jamaas and movements. That's tasty um, stuff, isn't it? It's not tasty stuff because it makes tasty really. Because bro, you know, and tasty you, comments. No, because 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 the beginning of Five Pillars in 2013, the first six to 12 months. Me and Roshan had to deal with accusations of being a front for Hizb al-Tahrib, of being a front of the Iranians, for being a front for the Salafis, for being a front for the Muslim Brotherhood. All of them. For literally everyone. Like, and, and, that's, and then it got to a point where we were like, okay, we must be doing something right. Because we're being literally accused of being a front and apologists for every, Brilliant. more or less every group of yeah. movement. So I think dealing in the Muslim space is very different, but has its own challenges. Uh -huh. yeah. I would also argue, humbly speaking, that there are other online outlets out there that claim to do Muslim news, but they, they specifically choose to either cover entirely positive stuff mm -hmm. and thereby creating this bubble or c specifically focus on the oppression stuff. Mm. There's not anyone that's humbly out there. I'm not, I'm not bigging five pillars up or anything. I'm, I'm just saying. I, it, it's, you are. No, but, there's, <laughs> no, but there is, whenever someone says humbly speaking, but I am because there's no other some issue is going to go down. There's no other independently regulated Muslim news website. There we go. So now, now, now it's coming. That's the advertising. Yeah, exactly. No, no, See, we, I just need no, to probe him a little bit we, and just find him. Make him feel comfortable that it's okay to do this. Yeah. It is your platform. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, bro. There, there is no other Muslim news website which is independently sure. regulated and run by NCTJ qualified journalists. He said nothing. Who've had experience within the mainstream or within the normal media. Everyone otherwise. else that's out there, they've made a conscientious decision. Right, I'm only going to cover very, very positive stuff about how many sujus a football player makes or how. How often this Bengali cleaner cleans the haram, or how often people are getting bombed in Syria, or their news is pertaining to their scholar or their movement, and therefore the way they uh, disseminate news is influenced by a particular school or a movement or a theology. Yeah, yeah. That's not news. Yeah, the theme is very clear. You know, we cover the good, bad, and the ugly, yeah. right? Whilst having red lines, right? Right. Um, so I guess those are the challenges. But in terms of like the mainstream space, Hussein, right? Yeah. Have you ever written? or published work for a Muslim media outlet? Yeah, I, I, wrote, I wrote something for like the Muslim News a long time ago. Oh. Um, and I don't know if, if that ever got published. But like, <laughs> um, and there was somewhere oh, else, okay. there was somewhere else that I got published in, but it was like this very short-lived Muslim site. Hmm. Um, and it was a comment piece, and it was a comment piece about... Um, it was a comment piece about uh, Hajj scams. Okay. Um, which I'd done when I was a freelancer so between 2016 to when I took my job at, at Mel in 2018 I'd mm. done this kind of mini feature about hunch scams and I'd done it for a um, a not a British Muslim outlet but a Canadian Muslim outlet okay. who had reached out how long ago was that? that piece the hunch scams piece was in 2017 okay um, do you ever see yourself writing for Muslim outlets again? yeah I mean, it depends because like I don't. A lot of Muslim outlets reach out to me because they're like, "Do you want to write opinion pieces?" 
and I don't really want to do that. Um, you know, I'm not really a big fan of it. And I don't write, I don't really write opinion pieces generally. Like I do the odd thing for like prospects. Mm. It's more about like a book review that yeah, yeah, hinges yeah. onto something. But I've always kind of, number one, I feel like I'm very bad at an opinion writer, like being an opinion writer. Like there's a reason why all my pictures to comment is free, like just get rejected yeah, yeah. all the time. Like I'm just not an opinion writer. I'm someone who writes reports and like mm. does features. So if it's like reportage, I'd be really keen on doing that. The issue at the moment is like, number one, I don't really need to pitch anyone because I have a day job and I don't sleep enough as it is. Mm. <laughs> um, and I've been doing this book for the past two yeah, years. Yeah. So I've turned down a lot of work. Um, the second thing is just that the Muslim sites who do come up to me are kind of like, we want to write opinion pieces about, you know, um, and that can range from anything from like, you know, liberal Islamic talking points to uh, like why prevent is actually a good thing and like all that stuff. And in any situation, regardless of my opinions on stuff, it's just like, I just don't write opinion. Okay. So if a Muslim site was like, hey, do you want to write this feature, like this reported feature about like a masjid who, you know, a masjid that's kind of having problems getting planning permission, which is like a story that I think is vastly undercovered by mm. lots of mm. Muslim press, right? Um, I would do that like in a heartbeat. I just don't want to write opinion pieces. Okay. So you'd actually do news reports? Yeah. For... Well, just like feature reports. Feature stuff, reports, right? Right. Yeah. So does that mean if we, if we were to ever, if I were to ever give you a juicy story to report on, you yeah. can do it. We can talk about it, yeah. I mean, it, depends, it, also, it also depends on whether I think I'm the right person to do that story, right? But you haven't reached a point, I'm going to be frank with you, you've not okay. reached a point in your career where like, mm, I don't want to associate myself with these particular outlets. Um, no, I mean, I don't like, you know, I... Because it happens. It happens to a lot of Muslims who become authors, who become yeah. well-known in the mainstream space. Well, I, and, I, know, and they... I know that there'll be some Muslims who will be like, who will reach out to me and be like, why did you do this podcast, for yeah. example? Like, yeah. especially because of the Bradford Lit Festival and yeah. everything. Like, you know, so, so on the one hand, you're like turning away from like a, 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 like a Muslim-run arts festival, yeah. but you're doing the Five Pillars podcast. Like, you know, hypocrisy there. I love it. Um, love it. Love uh, it. You know, and we can have that conversation. I think they're two entirely different things. Yeah, like two entirely different experiences. Um, and this, I, this podcast ain't being funded by the Home Office, or it ain't receiving. It's not even about. Like, just read the letter that I wrote because yeah. it's not. You know, there's a reason why I left. The reason why I'm not doing it. Mm. Um, but my point is that there will always be people who are like, "Why are you associating with this?" In the same way that there are people who are like, you know, when my book was syndicated in the Times, for example, there were people who messaged me being like. Why is your book being syndicated in a murder, time? It has like an Islamophobic agenda. And it's a and murder outlet and mur murder outlet that's done Islamophobic. Right, right. You know, you, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, to which, like, I don't really know what to say other than you know, I need it's, to number one, it's not in my power. Like, my PRs did that, and yeah. like, second, I don't. In terms of like battles with media, like I don't think this is it. Like mm. this, you know, that's just my opinion on. No, no, fair enough. There will always be people who say those things, and I have always been someone who's just like take my work just as. It is. Mm. Um, now, obviously, there are like you know nuances in terms of you know if you publish on certain platforms, it's always going to be seen within a particular context. Of course. But then, as a reporter who's kind of been doing this for a long time, mm. I feel like you can also be aware of like whenever a platform is, um, whenever a platform is sort of guiding your work towards a particular direction, or whether the work that you produce is going to be used in a particular context. Mm. So, with that intuition in mind, I think there is you know. Do you ever see yourself working for a Muslim media outlet? Uh, maybe I don't. I don't know if I'm going to like continue working in media like after after this year. Like you know, there's a part of me that's like, maybe I just want to go try do academia again or something. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll get, we'll, we'll once get... you've caught up on all your sleep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, at the moment, I really like my job just because I like editing. Yeah. Um, I've been doing it for like a year and a half now. Mm. Uh, I like the editing side as well as the reporting side. Um, and I also just like working, you know, I've done the Muslim stuff for such a long time. And I think the book was really a culmination yeah. of, you know, because so much of the book is just like stories that I've collected over the years. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of said a lot of my piece in terms of that in the book. And I really kind of appreciate the fact that with the magazine, I get to write about like different people in different situations. Mm -hmm. And my interest first and foremost is just like how ordinary people deal with like extraordinary situations or like the extreme lengths that people go to, to mm -hmm. kind of figure out who they are and ascertain like parts of their identity. Sure. Um, so I don't know, I really like my job right now, mm. but that doesn't mean that like I won't write from Muslim media outlets if I find a story that would work for a platform or whether they bring a story that would work for a particular platform. Well, all that would work for them and that would work for me too. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I beg you don't become those kind of elitist guys that never 
I mean, just... I would hope that I'm not. Don't become... I would hope that I'm not. Like, don't especially don't. because so many of, like, you know, I'm aware of, like, the, the, how I've got to this place has depended on so many good. obvious good. people. Right? I'm not going to... So, I just kind of just... Yeah. Don't, don't forget the roots, man. Yeah, please, yeah. please. <laughs> and, and look, on, on the issue of Bradford Literature Festival, right? Yeah. And obviously you were included in the, in, 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 in the itinerary, in the final brochure, and there were a number of withdrawals. Um, uh, Suhaima Manzul Khan, Malia Bouatia... Um, who are Sahar al Faifi, mm. yourself. Um, I got an invitation, but I didn't make it to the brochure, but nevertheless, I withdraw my invitation. Okay. But, okay, so so, so, you, so you withdraw from the Bradford Literature Festival because, long and short of it, there was some revelation that uh, the initiative had received some funding from the Home Office from a country extremism program, yeah. uh, building a stronger Britain together. Right, and you wrote in your letter in explaining why was that you felt that had you spoken on that platform, that you would have let a lot of people down uh, who who expressed uh, the the kind of discrimination, the targeting under the prevent scheme and under counter extremism, generally yeah. speaking. Um, are you, and, and and is that a stance that you're generally going to take moving forward now? I think whenever I do events, I have to really think about how much of it is for myself and how much of it is for like my sources. So. The platform that I, the the the, the um, panel that I was supposed to be on was about the experiences of young South Asian men. Yeah. Um, and you know, even though I'm sure I would talk a bit about myself, I would mostly be speaking about my sources. I'd mostly be speaking, be speaking about the young men who are like either turning to online environments or mm. building their own online environments. And so many of those interviews that I I had done kind of started from a very similar place, which was that they felt that they were restricted in terms of how they could express themselves in terms of their religious identity because of like the apparatus of CBE. Um, you know, it's important, you know, just because people will pick up on it, like BSBT is not part of Prevent, but it is part of like the overall CBE, CBE apparatus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you're a journalist and you're being told stories, like the responsibility that you have to your source doesn't end as soon as it gets published, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that you kind of learn as you work, which is that these sources are people who have entrusted you. And while you're, while I'm getting this platform to like speak about my book and like, go on book festivals and everything, they're not. They were the ones who took their time out to speak to me and to be very open with me um, and hopefully be very honest with me. And I really appreciate that. So part of showing that appreciation is respecting those stories and respecting the context in which those stories are told. Mm -hmm. Now, if this was like a situation where it was just about me and my experience, like if this was a memoir, for example, I, fit, I don't know if my opinion would have changed. Like maybe I would have found some use in kind of telling my story or even you know because some, some of the defenders of like what's going some of the people who are staying on are saying you know there's no point like boycotting or there's no point kind of putting D out with the festival dissenting views from within country. right because you need to tell these people like yeah. why and maybe if it was like a memoir or yeah. something that yeah. would have been useful but yeah. this decision wasn't about me it was about my sources and it was about if i knew that like their starting point for telling me these stories was the effects that like the overall cv apparatus has had on them mm. then telling that in an environment where that was, you know, the, the current context of CV is like legitimate, mm. where it is um, at least kind of considered to be like a static point. Yeah. Um, that would have not been the right context to tell that story. So moving forward, any other events uh, uh, or conferences that may be overtly, directly or indirectly linked uh, to CVE, would you be taking similar stuff? If it's if it's about like the book and it's about telling the stories from the book, then it will still be like a no, right? Mm -hmm. Because I need to respect my sources and first and foremost, in relationship to that book, I am a journalist. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's about me, if it's about kind of my experiences or growing up in my environment, it depends on what the event is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not one of the people. I'm not one of the people who's calling for a boycott of mm -hmm. BLF. I also don't. You know, there are also some contexts where like boycotting aspects of like prevent or the boycotting aspects of CV, I don't think are as effective as others. Um, but again, that's a relative thing. So all of that is just speaking like hypothetically. But, but, but you're speaking at an alternative event, right? In Bradford this um, Sunday, I believe? Yeah, I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing a reading. Yeah. Um, again, like the thing that I've kind of made clear is that like, I don't, I'm not an expert on prevent and I'm not someone who like is an activist in that space either. And I don't want to like take up space that has been done by really good activists, especially Muslim women of color mm -hmm. who have been really active in this space for a long time. So I'll be doing some, I'll be doing like a couple of readings and maybe like a short kind of overview, but it won't be like, you know, it won't be the panel that I was initially assigned to. Do you consider yourself to be woke? Uh, do I consider myself woke? Uh, I don't know. I try, I try my best to be conscientious of people. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, look. Oh, okay, fine. So, so, so <laughs> I'm conscientious. Yeah. So, so you've you've taken a principal stance, and I applaud you for that. And um, but on, in a recent Radio Four interview, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. In a recent Radio Four yeah, interview, question, I was like, oh, this is okay. gonna get spicy. Yeah, okay. you thought you'd get away with that. But listen, in a recent Radio Four interview, right, yeah. You you described Sarah Khan's book. Now, for those of you who don't know who Sarah Khan is, um, well, I'm not even going to bother telling you who Sarah Khan is. You can Google it yourself. Uh, she's the head of uh, the Commission for Countering Extremism. Um, you know, he said he's been very PC about it, but she's the ACF female version of Majid Nawaz. But, in, but look, you described her book as a very good book. It is a good book. It is. It's very like... It's called authored by the Home Office. Okay, so let me let me explain what I meant. She barely wrote any of it. Let me explain what I wrote. Right? But she dedicated more pages to me than you did. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> she spoke about me. She would have yeah, yeah, ten though. She she did. Did. You, got like, you got like a page or two in there, right? No, I didn't. I got more than a page or two. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, I was okay. like nine pages. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is why we have this difference of opinion. Yeah. Were you like furious when you heard yeah. this? But, no, I, I, was, I was listening very just like you say. Good yeah. idea. Sarah Khan's very good book. Bang! What do you say to say there? You <laughs> are. What I meant by good book is not kind of in the sense, or like not not in kind of the sense that, you know, it was like a well written book or that it's kind of this like really beautiful piece of literature. Yeah. Um, Thank God. But it's a useful book. Okay. It's a useful book in understanding. For who? I mean, for anyone who's interested in this space, right? Anyone okay. who's interested in like the effects of CBE, anyone who is interested in like the experiences of like particular Muslim women, um, especially because you know, I, I even in the book, I you know, I spoke to women who were very pro Sarah Khan, yes. very pro inspired, yes. very pro prevent. Mm -hmm. These were people who were living in Bethnal Green, whose kids went to the Bethnal Green school, yep. and their kind of change of opinion came when those girls left oh, over to go to Syria. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so. They exist, right? And so you're saying that it was a very good book in terms of that there was some relevance to it to some segments of the community. Yes, and also because it kind of tells stories about an aspect of the community of, of of the bigger Muslim, like British Muslim communities that I feel are sometimes like neglected or sometimes kind of referenced, but not necessarily given a lot of attention to. Like, um, well, I mean, just like in terms of Muslims who are. You know, supportive of prevent right yeah. and the reasons why they do so because i think there's also a very reductive way in which sometimes they're spoken about which is oh you know they're like the jump jars they're like the people the who, sellouts. you know they're sellouts or yeah. they're people native who, informants you know even that right um and i think that like uncle it, tom's it's much more nuanced than that like yeah. there are reasons why different people especially people who don't have you know because we often speak about we often speak about people in those terms with like big platforms, right? Mm. People who are like openly advocating. Of course, and, and, and just to clarify, right? Just to clarify, not every single person who works with Prevent is a bad person, right? right. I've met some, some, some Muslims who have engaged with Prevent that are genuine, very nice people, and they genuinely yeah. believe that there is an extremism problem within the yeah, community. Very, very well intended. But the likes of like, you've taken that principal stance, right? <laughs> Right. And a commitment to the people that you've interviewed and the, and the relationships that you've built. Sarah Collin isn't just anyone. She's like she's like the the godmother of of, of the entire CVE industry in the UK. So to so to say her book is a, a very good book, not even a good book, a very good book. Sure, it's or a, a decent of, read. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a decent read. It's like something that is worth reading. It's the right. biggest press release I've ever read of of, right. of pushing the prevent strategy. But lots of lots of books are like that, right? Lots of books are advocate you know advocate for a certain position. Lots of books that are like ghost written or like written by multiple people, um, <laughs> yeah. written in association with think tanks, for example, yeah. are like press releases. I think the issue, you know, I don't want to advocate that, oh, you should like stay away from this book. No, no, or... I, I just find it more interesting that you've yeah. taken a principal stance with the Bradford Literature Festival, citing specifically CVE. Right. But in the same breath, not too long ago, you were in an interview basically yeah. commending her book. Well, that was, same and, thing, and, and, she, and she perpetuates that very system. Same thing about the... And, but also just because I think that it gives an insight into the British Muslim experience. That is, if you're going to write about the subject, because also I reference her book yeah, you in do. a couple of those things. You do. Like a couple of those things are footnoted. Yeah. Um, in the same way that like books by James Ferguson yep. are footnoted. Uh, Saeed Avasi right. was also footnoted as well, right? There are other Muslim books um you know uh so how principled is this stance of yours against cv then sorry i, mean, I don't i don't mean to be yeah right. has I mean, it's not about cv it was like what what what, what am i doing am i doing stuff are you kind of sitting in the or? fence i don't know if i'm sitting <laughs> neither, 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 yeah cv is a bit bad are you, are you playing a bit no i think you know i i i'm kind of like hostile to cv apparatus yeah 
I think when I say that like that book is a good insight. You said you said a very good book. I still you know I you know this is a you know I still think that it's worth reading. Okay. It's a good it's a good book to read, right? I don't think that you should. I've read it. it. You know my book might be a very good book even if you disagree with everything. Your book's much better. Okay, thank you. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. Um, I'll put that on like advertising yeah, in the future. And I know that the home office didn't write it for you either. <laughs> so well, good. well, here's here's a little exclusive. I'm yeah. just joking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, in order to kind of get the snapshot yeah. of the British Muslim experience, you kind of need to pull from multiple sources. So, for example, like James Ferguson is a friend of mine. Mm. I really like him. Um, his book is really nice. It's yeah. a really good book. I also felt like it was very limited in certain ways. It mm. was limited in the way that it kind of approached this subject through the lens of geography, which meant that he spent a lot of time in quite dense Muslim communities, speaking to community leaders and spending a lot of time in mosques and everything. And my book is like very, very different to that. In many ways, it almost it challenges that theory yeah. that like the way that you understand Muslims is through like material lived geographic experience. Mine is like, no, actually, like you can learn a lot more. But you've actually mentioned, from... you mentioned that quite overtly. You said that yeah. the book is kind of not dedicated to it, but it, it, it kind of shows you an alternative away from institutions and mosques and community right. leaders. And same with Saeed the as well. Yeah. That's not, to, you know, I think Saeed the Varsity's book is a very, very good book. And it's something that I feel like is definitely worth reading. But I also disagree with a lot of the way that she's kind of approached certain subjects. And because certain subjects are seen through a particular lens, which is like a very insider political lens, right? Well, well she was part of the establishment that, right. that contributed right. towards it as well. So when I say that it's a very good book, what I meant was that it's a very good book in understanding this subject and okay. it's worth reading. It's not an endorsement um, in the same way that I don't endorse any of the other books that I've referenced. But it's just like something that if you want to understand this subject, I think is worth reading. So moving forward in terms of, I know you briefly mentioned uh, not too long ago, you're like, you might not even continue with media. So yeah. are you positioning yourself for big ambitions? I don't know. I feel like I, I was very, I was much more ambitious when I was younger than I than I am now. Really? I kind of like when I go to sleep now, yeah. right? You know like how hard it was to wake up this morning? I was just like, <laughs> it's like two hours to bed for... Did, did you consider, really? consider cancelling on me? Yeah, I was just like, maybe I should just like say I'm sick Fair. and I hate some like dodgy budget or something. <laughs> um, but I was like, no, I promised you I'm going to do it. No, we're grateful, bro. Um, yeah, we're no, it's good, it's good. Um, you know, I think my experience with media has always been that like, it's never going to be a career ladder where, you know, I have friends and cousins who are lawyers who are like, in five years time, I want to be senior associate or I want to be a partner yeah. or I want to like move to an international firm when you work in media like you don't have that luxury thank right? you thank um, you <laughs> but, but when you ask me because one of the questions my father-in-law asked me when I first got married is where do you see yourself in five years and I was like I was like you can't ask a journalist that question yeah because it's not so structured yeah the, the, the journey to wherever you're going to it's yeah. not so structured five years ago I said that I wanted to be like a political reporter and I wanted to have like an office in Westminster yeah and now I'm in Bedford talking about a book I wrote about British Muslims it's nice to do. um you know and I'm happy that I'm here and I'm much happier that I'm here I'm than I am that. in Westminster mm -hmm. um not least because like those offices are really damp and rank and yeah, like, you know, not stale. Yeah, you know, the idea of like a Westminster office sounds better than it actually is. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't know if like this time, like I'll still stay in media. I think that right now I'm kind of in a really good position where I like building, you know, building things and like being at this new magazine that is making some moves in the US and like throughout Europe is really nice. But I don't know whether I, you know, You've also like heard about the news of like BuzzFeed and Vice and stuff where five years ago, these are like these big unicorn yeah, companies of who are disrupting media. And then last year, both have like laid off like a significant proportion of, course, of their like staff. staff right? yeah, yeah. So even if you have these ambitions, your bosses might not have the same ones as you. So all of a sudden those ambitions get slashed, right? Yeah. So I just kind of, so my ambition for the next five years or so is just to kind of do the best that I can and whatever I do still kind of maintain that real interest in people mm -hmm. and real interest in kind of the struggles that people go through. And whether that's through journalism, whether that's through academia, or even whether that's through like, you know, teaching, mm. like, you know. Okay. So, so possibly academia, but you're chilling at the moment, yeah? I'm taking a couple of months off. Wicked. Um, and I just, you know, we'll see what happens after yeah. that. And as the podcast comes to an end in that, you know, you spoke about a lot of the book, in fact, the entirety of the book is about um, you know, people's experiences and, 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 and the challenges and, and the expression of their faith and their identity. 
But as someone who is a Shia Muslim, yeah. I felt that there was a lack of representation yes. from, the, from the Shia community in this book. Yeah, I mean, number one, it wasn't supposed to be representative of any community. So it wasn't like being a representative of anything. But you're right in kind of saying that... Well, the vast majority of the people in the book majority were Sunni. Sunni. Yeah, and of like the minority groups that are there, like, you know, there's a section of like Ahmadis yeah. and everything. But there's very, other than that, there's very kind of few references to... How did you... Uh, again, you're going to be very PC about it, and that's fine. Okay. <laughs> But, but look, look, the vast majority, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. The vast majority of the Muslim, the vast majority of the Indian subcontinental Muslim community don't regard the Qadianis as Muslims. Yet right. you decided to include them. I in, felt that they had an interesting experience. And I think that so long as they were identified, so long as their struggle yeah. was also like the struggle of like trying to convince people that they were Muslim. Hmm. And also, yeah, no. also because they have like a very good like media um uh what you call it strategy media strategy they're very very good online i wouldn't really call it a media strategy when the media comes to your doorstep pretty much all the time have, so. but like have you know they're very you know compared to like bro one lot listen to me i've been on a number of um news scenes so when the london bridge attacks happened when finsbury happened yeah do you know what they do they're just there. They're just there, right? They're just there, approaching into it. Uh, I, I am, I'm this person. I've got this to say, and they're literally scooping interviews. Yeah. Are having a presence there, and the producer and the camera and 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 and, and the journalist doesn't know none the wiser. Yeah, yeah. They don't know this person is from a movement who's yeah. who's not regarded as Muslim within yeah. the community. But that's a crazy strategy. Yeah. It's also like very effective. It's also like, you know, I don't. I'm. I again, like you're right. I'm not going to make any comment about like how yeah, just that they are. Um, you know, but the one thing that I will say is that they are, you know, they're the ones who reach out to me on email a lot, right? They're the ones who are inviting me out to kind of, you know, go for coffees and tell me their stories. Yeah, because they're begs. Um, That's why. <laughs> they beg it, right? They beg it. If, 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 I'm not surprised. If, yeah. Anyway, but look, why? Why, why, why sheer, sheer experiences, man? I think so. I'd written a section. I'd mm. written like a quite a long section. Like, but sheer blade runner. What was the sheer blade runner? Oh, you know, like I tried to reach out to him, yeah. and he just wouldn't answer. Really? And then, yeah, and also like because there's a section on Speaker's Corner in yeah. there, right? And my idea was if I spent enough time at Speaker's Corner, I could spend time with like people and see what they were up to. Because like my interest was like, okay, Speaker's Corner is this really fascinating place where the actual geographic space is almost irrelevant now, like because so many people are just like streaming on their smartphones, mm. and you have things like Black Dunya and yeah, of course, content of course. over everything yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. stuff who are just like getting thousands yeah. upon thousands of views yeah. by just making it into like a TV show. Mm. Um, there's almost this incentive for people to be like very theatrical mm. and i remember like going there like and when you kind of introduce yourself as a journalist which is what you should do mm. if you're like an ethical reporter being yeah, like, of I'm a journalist i'm writing a book and everything like there's a lot of hostility yeah um there's a lot of kind of like they, assume that like you're you come you see yeah and you're coming for a hit job right you're, you're gonna do a hit job and then mm. even when i did like even when i published a piece about speaker's corner which i think was a very neutral piece mm. Um, the guy, the, the people, the Christians who, the Christian group who did speak to me, um, well, they said that they've made a response video, but yeah. they haven't published it. So I'm not just, I'm, you know, this was like months ago, yeah. but they were just like, you know, you didn't kind of get our story right. I was like, well, here's a transcript of everything, mm. right? So like, tell me where I went wrong. I didn't get anything. But the truth is you interview people, they expect you to include everything in that. Right. Interview. And they also That's kind of expect right. you to kind of see the world in the yeah, way yeah, that they exactly. see it. And it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Um, you know, but also they had set it up in an antagonistic way where it's like, okay, well, you're a Muslim, you have a Muslim name, right? Mm. So I know that you're going to do a hit job. It's like, we haven't even started yeah. speaking, <laughs> man. Like, you know, I've sent you the questions in advance during the interview, like you kind of had a go at me for like asking mm. follow-up questions mm. because yeah. it wasn't exactly what we agreed on. Like I did this in a very controlled way yeah. and you still think I miss and you miss here. Like, cool. you know, um, anyway, that's just, to answer like your main question. Um, I think when I was like writing about sex, I thought that would be like a really easy thing to do. I thought mm. it'd just be like, okay, well this person has this like Hussainia written in their biography mm. so this is kind of like the fundamental difference but the more you kind of wrote about it the more you were kind of digging in the more complicated the story got because it wasn't just a matter of like it was the same way as kind of if you approach it by just saying that all Sunni muslims are the same right which they're not which they're not yeah. you know and we, we all know that and i think the book kind of addresses that of but if we just kind of blanket took all Sunnis are the same it would have made like a really bad book right mm. now with like other sects it's exactly the same you've got these two things on the one hand 
I couldn't just say a section of like Shias because who are you talking about? Are you talking about the Aces? Are you talking about the Twelvers? Are you talking about the Ismailis? Mm. Um, are you talking about like Pakistani Shias? Are you talking about Indian Shias? Like their online interaction is so kind of different and their interaction of the world is so different that the more you dig into it, the more kind of space it takes up. And then you have the second question of like, well, if I include the Shias, do I have to include like the Hazaris? Do I have to include um, other like smaller sets of Muslims who don't? But they literally got no mention because you you there did. Was some. I think there's a couple. There, there, there is, there is, but but, but in yeah. terms of proportion, I'm, I'm, okay. I, I know you said to me before before we started yeah. the podcast, look, it wasn't about proportionate representation. Yeah, like, yeah. But you dedicated an entire thing for spaces for minorities. Yeah. Which included uh, Qadianis. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was where, that was where like that was where, the set, that was where the sets mm. was supposed to be, and it yeah. got cut out just because when in the final draft when my editor and i read it it was like this didn't this doesn't really do justice mm. to the people that you're writing about it kind of goes into like lots of different tangents mm. um and if people read this they'll be like well this was a very strong book which sort of like faltered because not enough attention was kind of given to like other groups especially when you're talking about online experiences how they're so different from the materials so what i'm hoping is that this book sells enough that will give me like and also bearing in mind i'm a debut author and debut authors don't get a lot of space this mm. was an 85,000 word book, mm. right? Um, you know, so I think to kind of do that justice, I would have needed like a good maybe 10,000. So a future edition, if that opportunity arises, Charlotte, may, yeah. may, may include something about it. Well, if you buy enough copies, I'll get okay, to do Charlotte. extended ones. Well, I'll speak to uncle and auntie and make sure they thank carry you, an ordering. Get all your uncles and aunties to buy stuff because okay. like they're the ones who keep asking for free copies. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm not making enough money on like if you want the bought ones. Look, man, Hussein, it was wicked having you on. Thank you so much. Right, so it was an yeah. Ab- yeah. barnacle of fake. And, um, I, I, you know, as we bring the podcast to an absolute end, can you just tell our viewers where they can actually buy the book? Sure, you can buy them in most Waterstones. Okay. Um, you can buy them from Hearst. You can buy them from Amazon. Um, you can buy them from Oliver's Bookshop. And you can buy them from, like, pretty much... And you can buy them from Daunt Books. Daunt Books has a lot because that's where our launch was. Wicked. And look, you know... Um, I have to offer you three things. Okay, I think I think I know which ones they are. All okay, right. so so you know every guest that comes on, we yeah. offer we offer them three things from the tradition that you know pre- previous armies uh, in Islamic civilization used to order conquering <laughs> cities. You either accept Islam, you either pay the tax, or we fight. But I'm not right. going to offer you that, yeah. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. So either it's an arm wrestle or a thumb war. You have to try some barn on sh- barn with us. Okay, well, definitely try some barn, and we'll have a thumb war because I feel like. I feel like you've kind of been lifting more than I have. No, no, but I, like I'm not. Do you know Aki's actually better at fumbles than me? Do you know? I, that? I am. I, I, but but do you know what? I've, I, I, I want, I've been giving Dilly a lot of stick recently with regards to his thumbwall <laughs> techniques. Mm. I find him to be very very oppressive. Right. And just basically just breaks the rule. Yeah, he's been watching too much like Turkish Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Turkish Game of Thrones. Oh, so, I, so, yeah. so, so I'm, so I'm, I'm well seated to keep an eye on him. But for, for him, it becomes shoulder, elbow, thumb wall. No, right. but, yeah. no, but I always get so, beaten. Huh? I always get beaten. Okay, I'll give you like an honourable fight. Sure. Give me an honourable fight. I, no, yeah? I think that has to be from his side. Right, okay. okay. We're, we're gonna have you tried Have, have you tried pawn before? I have. I mean, I mean we, always, we always have pawn. I've never, like, but getting like the, getting the stuff that you make hmm. yourself. You're not going to get high, thing. don't worry. You're not going to get high. No, no, yeah. Yeah, because a number no, of people... Like, well, you don't know. We could have been those type of guys. Yeah, you don't know. We could have spiked you there, I'm saying. It's a sweet song. It's a sweet mm. one. Yeah, it's like a uh, crushed rose petal. Right. Mm. Mm. Let's yeah. have it, mate. Is it happening? Yes. So, do I have to do the whole one, two, three, four? I invite you to a fun. I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> okay. 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 So, so what are the rules again? Hold on. So, I, the what, rules are. What can't I do? No, no, I, I've been beaten every time. Okay. What you? Got, it's a thumb war, right? So it's restricted to using your thumb only. Yeah. So what do I do? What have I done previously? So what you you, One, you, two, you, you, three, you four, four, I declare four, thumb wall. Then you bow. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay fine. Okay. Then you go. Well, yeah, but, and then you try to pin each other down. And you have to count three. Hussein, you got white thumbs. He does. He does. He does. Oh, here we go. I also have a. <laughs> oh, it's happened. One, two, three. It's done. <laughs> I'm not longer doing thumb wing. <laughs> Take the elbow, it. brother. No, because I always get beaten. Okay, so you can't decide what you want to do. <laughs> it's given to so the guest. Brother, brother, why do you push me forward for a thumb wall? Why don't you do a thumb wall? Hang, hang, hang on a moment. Hussein said himself yeah. that I, it seems like you've been pushing weight more than I have recently. So I'll have some fun. <laughs> oh, you should be happy he's taken two of the three options. I've not won a single thumb wall yet, man. How many thumb walls you had? You had Sim, 
Who beat me? Sim who beat you, but Sim had something crazy going on, some Chicago technique. Smile to Janna beat me. Uh, Smile to Janna, did you have something with him? Yeah, I think. Well, no, no, you had, had Barn and Arm wrestle. Oh, yeah, and you beat me with two, uh, two yeah, hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Oh, my. Oh, yeah. No, no, okay. he cheated. Okay. Yeah, he, okay. he cheated. Hussein, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And brothers and sisters, Zakhalakha, for tuning in. Subscribe to the Five Pillars channel. Like this video. Leave a comment. Doesn't always have to be a good comment. Give us some feedback. And um, yeah, that's all for today. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Burma's podcast. Five Pillars of Mad Monarchs production.